John chapter 4 and James chapter 4. The Gospel of John chapter 4 and James chapter 4. Today, starting off the new year, I'm going to teach principles that will help you develop a closer relationship with God. In fact, I simply entitled the message, How to Develop a Close slash intimate relationship with God. You need to be closer to him than you are. How many would agree with that? And uh, there, there are some reasons maybe that people are not close, and I'll go through some of them. I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but there's, there's a couple of simple ones. You know, one thing I learned a long time ago, if you want something, you'll get it. If you want something bad enough, you'll, you'll put forth the effort to get it. Because that's the way people are, you know. They say, well, Pastor, you know, I can't get off work to come to church. I say, guess what? When you want to get off work for a reason bad enough, guess what you'll do? You'll get off work. You'll find a way. You'll find a way to get the time that you need to do what you want to do. Because when people want to do something, wild horses can't stop them. People think the strongest thing in the universe is God. No, the strongest thing in the universe is your will. Because your will can stop God. And people don't realize that. Your will can stop God from doing some things in your life. Amen. Because God will never violate your will. That's what makes him God. He gave you a free will, but he won't violate it. But his desire is that you develop a close, intimate relationship with him. Now, I have so many notes, and the Spirit of God is going to have to help me because I've laid it out, but I get a little, I get a little uneasy sometimes when I start a message because I want to be in the perfect will of God. And I've long since learned that the perfect will of God is letting God do it and me not. So, you know, I lay it out. I go as far as I can take it, then I turn it over to him. So let's, let's read our foundation scriptures and maybe a couple of others, knowing that where I'm going is teaching you how. See, there's always, a, teaching always involves a how. I can give you some information. I can tell you what it is, but you can't get blessed until you start doing what God says to do in his word. So you need to know how to do it and how to do it correctly. Amen? Okay, John chapter 4. We read this part of this already. Verse 22 says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and what? And what? So now is the time that God is seeking these people. Now is the time when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Turn to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, just want to read one verse of scripture, verse 8. It says, draw nigh to God, and he, God, will draw nigh to you. But notice, God won't draw nigh to you until you first do what? draw nigh to him. So you have to draw close to him before he can draw close to you. Now, I was uh, reading something this week, and I found it to be very, very interesting. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there were some things laid out in a way I had never seen it before. Uh, and it had to do with prayer. There are many words for prayer in the, in the Old Testament. But there's a section of scripture where God was dealing with the people, and he talked about three things. There's there's three Hebrew words. One of them was prayer, uh, and the Hebrew word used was talifa. Then the second word, which really surprised me, because I had to take a lot of time to, to spend some time studying out and looking at it and seeing why God threw that word in there at that particular time. But the second word is repentance. The second word is repentance, and the Hebrew word there was teshuva. And then the third word had to do with the intent of the heart. The intent of the heart. And that word in the Hebrew was kavanah. So God was talking about prayer from the standpoint of prayer 
repentance and intent of the heart. And he was talking about people coming to him after they had repented. I say after. After they had repented. And ha you need an understanding of what repentance is. And then the intent of the heart was the thing that drove the people to pray to God. So therefore, if, if the heart is not right, you'll never pray. You'll never talk to God on the level that he wants. And the reason he used that in that particular section of scripture that I was reading is because the Bible makes a very plain reference to God judges what? So your heart is very, very important. So you can't play with God when you're praying. You can't use Mickey Mouse words in talking to God because he's saying, if you're going to talk to me, first of all, you've got to repent. You've got to take care of some things. Then secondly, the intent of your heart has to be correct before you bring anything to me. And I said, wow. It's like he was serious, and he wasn't angry or anything like that, but he was just being serious with, with how they dealt with these issues. And then the question came up in my heart, you know, why is it so difficult for people to develop a closeness or an intimacy with God? And right away he answered. This is real simple. It's real simple. It has to do with that, that, that uh, intent of the heart. In other words, if you want to be close to someone, you will purpose in your heart to be close to someone. Hello? Now, the only way you cannot be close to someone if that person doesn't want you to be close. But we've already determined that God wants you to be close. He, in fact, he set up the whole system. You go all the way back to Exodus where he delivered the people from Egyptian bondage. Moses said, uh, or God said to Moses, I brought the people unto myself. So his intent was to bring the people to him so he could minister to, or so they could minister to him so he could develop a relationship. But it had to be based on what was in the heart of the people. So if you're going to have a close relationship with God, it has to be based on what's in your heart. Do you really want to have a close relationship with God? So you need to ask yourself, well, see, people say yes, but if you have a close relationship with God, something unique is going to happen. God's going to dissect you and open you up. He's going to expose you to you. And he can't expose him to you until he exposes you to you. Amen. See, you won't stand before God and ask a bunch of questions because between now and then, he's going to show you how you missed it, why you don't have what you have. And see, that's what happens with developing a, developing a close relationship with God is you really get to find out who you are and who you're not. So there's a whole lot of people live on the who they want to be. But no, you need to find out who you are and you need to develop into what God wants you to be before you even think about what you want to be. Amen. Amen. So I was, I was looking at that and I asked that question, you know, well, why? Why is it difficult to obtain intimacy with God? And this was the answer. It was really, I've had to write it down. It was so long. <laughs> Developing a closer relationship with God is great. It's an admirable desire. But only those in Christ who desire a close relationship can ever obtain a close relationship. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to desire a relationship with God. Not that you saved, that you have to desire a close relationship with God. Also, you need to know something. In this body, you will never have a relationship so close that, in other words, you, you might say, I want to have a real, real, real. Well, you can only go so close to God as long as you're in this body because there's something slowing you down. Remember that word repentance that we dealt with? There is such a thing as continuing sin or things that you're doing on a regular basis that would hinder you from having the kind of relationship with God that you want. Amen. And don't sit there and say, well, I don't do nothing. I'm an angel pastor. See my halo? I don't do nothing wrong. No, you may not do something wrong, but you think wrong. Amen. 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 You may not do what you think is something wrong, but you're talking about someone. Amen. You're not really doing everything that you really should be doing. So I think because he told us in his word that he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, 
and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Well, if God has to work on our imperfections, we must have some. Huh? So I want you to look, at the, look around the room because I don't want you to think that you're by yourself. Okay, just look around the room. Just put your eyes on somebody. If you want to remember them, fine, but every person you put your eyes on, they have imperfections. Every one of them. Some have more than others. Some are working on them, some are not. But the bottom line, they have imperfections, and those imperfections hinder them from having the close relationship with God that they really, really want or they really, really need. For example, um, these are some of the ones I write down because I know people, people do this on a regular basis. Um, people refuse to pray. People refuse to serve. People refuse to treat one another correctly. People refuse to give properly. They refuse to have their own personal praise and worship. People refuse to search out and find out their God-given purpose. They're just living day to day, but they're not focusing on the things that, that God wants them to focus on. People refuse to read their Bibles. Refuse. Some folk haven't read their Bible in so long. When you open it up, cobwebs, I mean, the moths fly out of the pages. People really refuse. You know why they refuse? It's their will. And remember now, to have a close relationship with God, God is dealing with what? What's he dealing with? I can't hear you. He's dealing with what? He's dealing with your what? Heart. Now, write this down in your Bible because I'm not going to have time. I'm not going to cover it today, but I will get to it. But there, there's a process I have to go through to giving you a revelation on how to get close to God, okay? I just want to give you the first five things that have to happen. If you want to get close to God, we'll, we'll look at those, okay? Number one, the first thing you have to do to get close to God is you must purpose in your heart to want to get close to God. In other words, there has to be a focus in your heart and mind of a desire to want to get close to God. That's number one. Something on the inside of you has to want to be close to that person. Amen. Just like when you, you met a man or you met uh, your husband, your wife. There was something on the inside of you. You wanted to be close to that person. Well, you have to want to be close to God because God doesn't force himself on you. He says crazy things like, whosoever will, let him come. In other words, he wants it, but he says, it, the ball's in your court. If you're, you have a will and desire, then I'm going to make it happen. Because that's what the scripture says in James. Draw near to God and he will, he will draw near to you. But it starts with you having a desire to draw close to God. That's number one. And that's not God's part. That's on your part. Uh, there's a scripture in um, uh, Psalms 37, Psalms 37, 4, I believe it is. It says, delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you what? Delight thyself in the Lord and he'll give you what? So God is going to give you what? Desire. Stop. Not desires plural, but desires what? Singular. In other words, whatever desire you don't have that you need, if you delight yourself in God, he'll give it to you. You say, well, I don't have a desire to get close. Talk to God. He'll give you the desire. Because the only way you can get close is to have the desire. And the scripture says, ask and what will happen? And everyone that asketh what happens? So everybody that asks God for a desire, he's going to give it to you. Everybody. So you can't say, well, you know, I never did uh, draw close to God. It's because you didn't have a desire and you didn't have enough care and concern to ask God to give it to you. Because he will do what? He'll give it to you. Okay? So that's number one. Well, let's, let me look, look at a couple of scriptures. Turn to Psalm 73 real quick. Psalm 73, Hebrews chapter 7. I don't like to just just regurgitate a bunch of stuff. I want you to see it in Scripture, okay? Psalm, the 73rd Psalm. Seventy-third Psalm. Thank you, Lord. I received that, and I'm going to start doing it. Yeah, okay. I will do that. Um, 73rd Psalm. If you have it, say, I have it. 
If you don't, say, help me, Lord. <laughs> okay, he'll help you. Okay, Psalm 73, look at verse 28. Psalm 73, verse 28. It says, but it is good for me to what? It is good for me to what? So how many of you know that drawing near to God is what? Good. Is what? Good. Is good. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all thy works. But he says it's good for you to what? Draw near to him. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And you can turn to Hebrews chapter 10 after that. Hebrews chapter 7. I want to read verse... Verse 18, nope, verse, uh, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 7, verse, nope, I'm in the wrong scripture. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19. It says, for the law made nothing perfect. That's the Old Testament. It didn't make anything perfect. But the bringing in of a what? Better hope, or actually better covenant did. By the which we draw near unto God. So how do we draw near to God? It's based on this, this better hope or this better covenant. In other words, the new covenant gives us a right to draw near to God. See, they couldn't draw near to God in the Old Testament, even though he wanted them to. But Jesus had to make the way for us to be able to draw near to God. That's why the scripture says, uh, I, Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, but what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the God, Father but by me. In other words, no man can get close to God except through Jesus. It's the only way he can do it. All right? Now, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. He says, having therefore, brethren, a boldness to enter into the what? Enter into what? Enter into what? Now, that's where God is. God is in the Holy of Holies. But notice, he says you have to have a what? A boldness. See, in the Old Covenant, they were scared to do that. They didn't want to, in fact, they didn't even want to enter the temple. At least, I'll say one thing. The people in the Old Covenant had enough sense to say, look, if I'm not right, I better stay away from God. Because, see, if they weren't right, they would drop dead people today don't have that right. We, we have a grace and we have a, a freedom that actually too, too much grace and too much freedom. Because basically people do what they want to do and they don't always do what's right. They don't always live right. I said they don't always do. Oh, let me ask a question. Do you always live right? I want to, I want to meet the perfect person. You always do everything right. Every day, every hour, every minute, every second, you do what's right. Because that's what you want to do. I would like to shake your hand. Ain't none here. No hands up. Huh? Hmm. I wonder why. Because Jesus said there's none perfect. No, not one. So if one raised their hand, we got to get rid of that person. We got to get him up out of here. Something wrong with that guy. Or a woman. Amen. He says, having therefore, brethren, what? Boldness to do what? Enter in the holy. So you can't just enter in. You've got to be bold enough to come into the presence of God. Okay, in fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, come how? Boldly to the throne of grace. So you can't go in there with your tail between your legs. You can't go in there saying, you know, Lord, if it be your will. If it be your will, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. No, that's not how God works. He says, how? Come boldly. He says all the promises of God are what? Yea and amen. He wants you to be blessed because he's already blessed you. 
But you, when you come into his presence, you've got to come boldly. C come like you somebody. You're one of his children, so come like you. Look, when you go to your mama's house, you go straight to the refrigerator and open it up. Why do you open it up? Because that's your mama's house. <laughs> and you think you have a right to go into mama's refrigerator. Now, when you come to my house, you can't go to my refrigerator. My wife will shoot you on sight. <laughs> no, come on. You go do things because you feel you have a right to do them. Can I get an amen? amen? Huh? So you go home to mama, everybody goes right to the refrigerator because they have a right to. See, people don't understand the principle of righteousness because when you understand the principle of righteousness, you will do things because you know you have a right to do it. God has given you a right. You have right standing with him. But he says something in his word. He says, seek ye what? First. First, the kingdom of God. So most of you are in the kingdom. If you're born again, you're in the kingdom. So you don't have to seek the kingdom. You may have to seek some benefits in the kingdom, but you're in the kingdom. Because see, the second part of that is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? His righteousness. All that means is seeking and learning about how to do things right while you're in the kingdom. See, folk in the kingdom, they don't know how to do nothing right. One of the things we used to do when I was in the school of ministry, and I did this uh, to put fear and trembling in the hearts of the students. Yeah, I wanted them scared because they were in the school of ministry and they were there to learn how to be ministers of the gospel. Now, how many of you think that a minister of the gospel should at least know how to pray? Huh? So that's what I'd do. I'd come in the room and I'd say, um, I am going to ask you to pray. I'm not going to give you any warning. I'm just going to walk in. I may end of the, serve, end of the class, uh, start of the class, I may say pray. End of the class, I may say pray. During the middle of the class, I might say pray. Whenever I think about it, I'm going to point to someone and you stand up and pray. And don't let me hear no stuttering. Don't call yourself a minister of the gospel. Or call, I'm called, and you can't pray. Amen. Call of God. And when you, you'd be, you'd be shocked. Now, I hadn't taught them this. This was in the prayer class. Everybody say prayer class. Prayer. So I was teaching them to pray. Okay? Teaching them to pray. And we had people in the class, call of God. Christian, born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. Some stood up. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy. Sit down! <laughs> they hadn't learned to pray yet. They knew what's called the Lord's Prayer, but they didn't know how to pray. They didn't know how to quote some words from the Bible, but they didn't know how to pray. Hello? Amen. Huh? Amen. So when he says, come boldly to the throne of grace, don't you think, as a man and woman of God that has a responsibility over people, that don't you think you ought to know how to pray? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Another. Uh, there are if you're born again, raise your hand. See, some I'm scared to raise your hand because they know what I'm going to ask next. <laughs> as a born again believer, as a born again spirit filled believer, don't you think you should know how to pray? Yes. Huh? Yes. Now, if I did the same thing, I'm. No, see, if I say, say that, then folk won't show up next Sunday. They'd be too scared. Pastor's going to point, point out folk to pray. <laughs> Don't be hiding. <laughs> See, you, you, th you think that's not true. I did something once a few years ago. And um, if you're a Christian, aren't you supposed to do what the Word says? Yeah. What does it say in Mark chapter 16, verse 15? What's the first word? Jesus said what? Mark 16, 15 says, go ye into all the world and do what? So the word, Jesus said what? Jesus said what? So every Christian is supposed to do what? So I said, one day, this is, I forget what year it was, uh, I was instituting the um, Go Ministry. So the first Sunday we did it, we planned it, we had some leaders uh, set up. We had a bunch of leaders set up. They had their teams. They had everything all set up. It worked out, and it was easy. In fact, it went so smooth, it shocked me. But anyway, we went out that Sunday. 
Whole church. I told them, come to church, be casual. That's all I said. Come to church and be casual. It's going to be a fun day. And they came to church. And when I, we, had our, we had a short service. I said, okay, we're getting ready to hit the streets. <laughs> and when I say hit the streets, it was like I hit them in the mouth. Because <laughs> they didn't know that's what we were going to do. I said, don't be concerned. We're all set up. You know, we're ready for you to go. Anyway, we had a pretty good percentage of people that went out. Now, what some people did, they went out the church and they went to their cars. <laughs> and they went home because they were afraid to go. They had not been prepared to go, so they were afraid to go. See, I wanted to, to make a point. I wanted to help them understand that every Christian should be ready to go. You should be ready to minister to someone. Okay. So I, I told them. And we went out that Sunday. About three months later, I said, uh, next Sunday we're going to go out and we're going to hit the streets. That Sunday, the church was half empty. <laughs> so I said, Lord, I got to figure out something else because this is, this, is, this is not working. Your folk don't want to go. So it has to be, out, it, it has to be voluntary. Amen. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. See, those that don't go are going to have to stand before God and and you're going to have to talk to him. And whatever he's going to do to you on your own. Because I don't know. So I have to provide the avenue for people to do it. And those that are willing to do it, do it. That's as far as we can take it. Amen. We can't make anybody do it. You know, but it shows you people's hearts. So when he says, come boldly to the throne of grace, how does he want you to come? Huh? Does this... Everybody know what boldly means? Huh? With what? With confidence. So you're coming to God with what? Confidence. That should be, I mean, he loves you. It shouldn't be hard for you to come to him with confidence. I, I told a lady once, she, she um, it was in one of our prayer groups, and in our prayer groups when I was at CCC, uh, they go around like we do here. At least they better be doing it. When we have uh, the beginning of church, uh, the beginning of a meeting or the ushers. I know the ushers get in a group. and I'll use the staff. Staff gets in a group and we pray. A certain time, you know. And uh, we don't appoint people. Someone just starts praying. Now if I'm there and nobody starts praying, I, I pray. I'll say, you pray, you pray. You. But they do it. They just do it because they know they're going to have to do it. <laughs>